I think I need to make this stumpy bug look a little worn and used. <laughs> Now what I want to do in this video is demonstrate two techniques that while they're separate techniques, um, in my mind they, they go so well together that I think of them as one whole. And I, that's, that's what I call post-fading and post-shading. You've probably heard the term post-shading, which I'll talk a little bit about. You may not have heard post-fading. If you've seen where a modeler will use an airbrush or um, it can be done with a brush or a sponge or any other paints but using lighter colors maybe of the base color or maybe just a dusty color to provide some tonal variation all around the model that's a process of fading or distressing or things like that um, I had never really heard the term uh, distressing uh, when I started doing that on aircraft many years ago and at the time I just called it post fading so that's that's why I use that term post shading of course is something you've probably seen where there's an effort to kind of blur and darken the panel lines not just with panel line washes but going a little outside of that sometimes it's highly exaggerated sometimes it's very subtle but the idea being to enhance the shadows a little bit, make the, the panel lines uh, look distinct, maybe make them look a little bit dirty, but just really making them stand out. Now to talk a little bit more about post-fading, uh, it's designed to make the paint look faded and worn. It's not necessarily an effort to make the model look dusty, although it does that. And in some ways, it can be combining two steps of not only fading uh, and aging the paint, but of doing what you might have heard uh, uh, Martin Kovach on Night Shift Model, Modeler talk about pre-dusting. Um, it does leave a dusty appearance depending on the color you use. But its primary purpose in the way I do it is to uh, is to present kind of paint distressing paint fading I even do it over the decals so that it fades those a little bit you've probably also heard of pre shading and that's where a modeler will take a dark color uh, usually black but not always and will paint the panel lines before putting down any other paints paint along the panel lines very roughly with black or another color and then go over and focus on filling in between the panel lines and trying to bring the opacity up there and just letting some of the overspray get on over the black so that the hope is after the, the, the base painting is finished there's going to be some darker lines around all of the panel lining uh, to stand out. Now the reason I don't prefer this method is to be quite honest, the bulk of the time that I see it, it's very obvious that it's pre-shading. Um, it can be very difficult uh, if you're using, say, black for your pre-shading and then maybe painting over it with a lighter color, let's say a tan just for example. It can be very difficult to get the tan covering up the edge of that black line over where there may be gray plastic or primer or something like that. And in the areas right along the panel line, you can usually see the overspray, not always, but to my mind, to my eye, it's just not uh, the optimal way of getting it done. Um, and I've done it, but I've, I always end up looking at it and going that just so looks so obviously pre-shaded and of course you know while we're not striving necessarily for perfection um, we also try to do things so that it's not obvious uh, that okay here's a here's a painting technique and this is actually just a plastic toy we want it to look a little bit realistic so I think post shading does a better job because it's far more controllable and far more um, flexible in terms of its application. Now for picking colors, while it can vary, uh, 
Generally, I like to use a light tan color for my post fading. Um, it tends to make things look faded uh, when they're outside. You know that they, they fade and they get dull. And I, I find that that a tannish color works really well. I have used light gray because that does work better over some colors. Um, and you could use anything you wanted. Uh, but my favorite is to use a tan. Now, the one that I use most often is to me is XF55 Deck Tan. And you can see that it's just a very light uh, tan color, very warm. But I've found that this works well over just about any color. Um, I've used this on hundreds of models, uh, whether they were, you know, your typical Spitfire camouflage or an olive drab color. Um, I've used it over things that were navy blue. I've used it over desert colors. There's There's been very few colors that this won't work well over when heavily thinned. So if you're if you're not sure what color to pick, consider something like deck tan. Now for the post shading, I use something that while it's not my idea, it's a mix um, that I saw someone else using. And I've got this beat up bottle. You can see uh, that's that this bottle's been through a lot. It's two parts. Tamiya XF69, which is NATO black, and one part Tamiya XF9 whole red. Now what this does is it produces a, a very dark reddish, almost leaning into maybe a little bit of purplish color that works really well for not only post uh, shading of panel lines and things like that, it's great for exhaust stains and cordite stains and other kind of fluid streaks and exhaust streaks and things like that. Now, there are certainly alternatives that you could use, but what you're basically looking for is something that's a dark reddish brown. Now, you could use a very dark gray or a very dark brown, but I think something that has a little bit of warmth to it helps in the overall look of uh, the post the post shading of your model. Now, of course, you could use any brand of paint to do the post shading and fading. The reason I prefer Tamiya paints for this is because I can thin them with alcohol. And no, that's not the original packaging. Um, I can thin them with alcohol. This is 91% isopropyl alcohol. And the beauty of thinning Tamiya paints with alcohol is it allows me to get a very, very thin solution that because of the high evaporation rate of the alcohol, when I spray it on, I don't get a lot of spidering, I don't get a lot of running, I don't get a lot of pooling. It evaporates very quickly, but not so quickly that you can't get the color laid down and you can't control the opacity. You have a lot of control over it. Um, it allows you to build the layers up very easily it allows you to make multiple passes. You can thin it to the point that sometimes it may take six or seven or eight uh, uh, passes before you start really seeing the color build up. And that's a great way to make sure that you don't over exaggerate it and that you're entirely in control of the process. Certainly you could use other paints. You could use lacquer paints thinned with lacquer thinner. You could use acrylic paints thinned with acrylic thinners but I've found that I have far more control with this combination. Now, because this is an airbrushing technique, of course, I will be using an airbrush. Um, the airbrush that I'm going to use for this today is uh, Badger's Renegade Velocity Airbrush. It has a .2 needle in it. Now, it's, it's not so much important the brand of of airbrush, although I do highly recommend Badger. I've used them for years and really enjoy them. Um, the brand is not so much important as it is the thinning of the paint, which I'll show as we go further along, and the air pressure. I like to drop my air pressure generally down in the 12 to 15 PSI range. You can certainly go lower than that. You want it to be low enough that you're getting good paint flow but you're not getting splattering. So if you start doing this and you get splattering, you need to bring up your air pressure just a little bit. 
until you don't get any splattering. By having a smaller needle, it's just going to let it's going to let me be a little more precise about my application. Now, having said that, for many years, the only airbrush I had was a Badger Patriot, which has a .5 nozzle, and I did literally hundreds of models with that .5 nozzle. All I did was I just lowered the air pressure, lowered the opacity, and just had to work a little, little harder to get it to do the things I want. But this smaller needle airbrush, which allows me to, to deliver a finer line, is just going to make things a whole lot simpler. Now in terms of the order of things, when I do this in a build, I generally do this after I've done the decals and the panel lining because I this sometimes I don't want my panel lines to be too stark and using the post fading is going to tone those down a little bit and certainly the post shading is going to bring them back up to a certain degree uh, once I add that on. But in this case, I did gloss coat the model, put the decals on, use some oils for a panel wash, but this, this technique doesn't have to be done at this stage, but I find it works well because I'm starting to distress and weather the decals. Um, I'm kind of blending everything together, and it just seems to be a good point to, to do this. Of course, once you have the post shading and the post fading applied, then you can go over that with further weathering details. And you can always mix and match. You can do a little of one technique and then add in some other technique. There have been times that I would post shade and post fade a model, then put further weathering effects over it, and then go back and boost up some of the post shading and post fading over the other weathering effects. Um, post fading especially can be really good for toning down later effects. So while I tend to like to do it at this point of the model, there's nothing that says that you can't do it any time during the process. One other thing to point out before I start blasting paint through my airbrush, quite often when you see pre-shading on a model and distressing with an airbrush or something like that, quite often you'll see the, the lighter paint is sprayed towards the center of the panels. Now, that's done to, you know, it's supposed to make it look weathered and things like that. But there's a practical reason you have to do that, is if you've done all of that to get the pre-shading on there and, and visible, then you have to avoid those areas with uh, the highlighting and the, the fading, uh, essentially, in the middle of the panels. Now, one of the reasons that I prefer the post shading and fading combination is once I get the paint on here, I can do my fading without having to worry about avoiding the panel lines. Because if this were a real thing and it's out in the sun, it's going to fade all over. The sun's not going to say, hey, you know, uh, that's a panel line there, so I'm not going to shine quite as bright on that, just the things around it. Bet you didn't know that's how the sun talked, but yeah, it does. Um, scientific fact. <laughs> but anyway, it allows me to shade all over, or fade rather, all over without worrying about the panels. Now, if you like that look where it's, it's lighter in the middle and you're going for less of a distressed look to more of a faded look around the panels, go for it. It's your model. Do what you like, what you think is cool. But I just spray all over, as you're about to see, and then it allows me to go back with the post shading and concentrate on the panel lines. The post shading also works if you're not going to do post fading, but you're going to do modulation or lightening the panels um, ahead of time and, and using various uh, effects like that. The post shading still works in those areas because you've done everything to distress and fade and, and highlight the paintwork ahead of time so the post shading goes in over the top of all of that. All right, with all that blah, blah, blah out of the way, let me get my airbrush loaded up and actually get to the demonstration. I start by adding some of the uh, isopropyl alcohol into the color cup. I fill it up roughly halfway. There's no precise magical amount to start with. And then I put in just a single brush full of my paint and I stir that around, get it mixed in really well um, so that it's there's no clumps, there's no uh, 
lumps or bumps or anything like that. And then what I do is I start spraying it onto a test model because what I'm looking for is to see if the thickness of the paint, the opacity of the paint is correct. If it goes on too quickly, then what I do is I pour some out of the color cup and add more of the alcohol. If it's taking too long to build up the opacity, then I add some more paint into the color cup, just a little bit at a time. Once I'm happy with the way it works, I start, uh, start airbrushing. I start pointed off the model and then bring the, the airbrush onto the model. Now initially, I'm only pulling the trigger back just a little bit and there's not actually any paint flow. And then what I do is I just start slowly opening it up until I get uh, paint flow. Now, quite often, you won't see the paint initially in the first few passes. What you will see is a little gloss spot where the alcohol is hitting the surface of the model and it briefly flashes off. So that's what I look for is I know where that spot is. That's where the paint is going to be deposited. And I just begin a process of building up uh, slowly across the surface of the model the, the color. Now, how much you do this is entirely up to whatever effect you're trying to achieve. On this model, I'm going for more of a dusty appearance uh, rather than necessarily a highly distressed and mottled appearance. But if you wanted a more mottled appearance, then you would change the way you were um, putting this on. If you wanted a more dusty appearance, you may streak it more. So the the application can vary greatly depending on what it is you're trying to do but because of that very low opacity and the very low air pressure I'm able to control getting very little paint onto the model and putting it just where I want to and whatever amounts builds up uh, to, to achieve the effect that I'm looking for it's just a very very slow process that you don't want to rush but certainly take your time on to get it like you want. And you can see once I have that coat down, it's got a very dusty appearance. I've painted it over the decals, uh, fully over all of the pattern, and it's just given it kind of a uniform look. There are areas that there are, there's more fading and more modeling than, uh, than others, but overall it's just a dusty looking uh, vehicle. Now for the post shading, I put the same amount of uh, alcohol in my color cup and I go with the one brush full of paint just like I did before. The only difference this time is this paint is a little darker of course and uh, once I get that mixed in I start testing it on a model. Now what I'm looking for is uh, building up the color after just two or three passes. Um, you can thin it more than this uh, so that it takes more passes but I usually go for anywhere from two to five passes to start building up the color and the more you put on the more it builds up and you go and put this on the model just like you did before the, the difference is here of course that I'm focusing just on the panel lines I'm not going off into other areas well I could use this for things like cordite stains and exhaust stains if I do use this color for that I'll do it later now I tend to go heavier around panels that I think are going to have some kind of fluid leaks. Like to me this thing looks like the hood over part of, you know, some kind of mechanical component, maybe part of the engine or something like that. So on these areas I tend to go uh, a little heavier on the post shading than in other areas. But it's just a process of building it up. Um, working slowly. I tend to work in sections though you can do it uh, any way you want of course and uh, here you see I'm just putting it on a structural panel line I'm not going to go quite as heavy here as I would around that hood area simply because I don't think that in my mind that there's going to be the same kind of leaks and uh, things going on around that area as there would around the hood but at any point if the paint seems to be going on too too heavy then I just thin it out a little more. If it's too light, I add some more. If it gets clogged while I'm working, I don't necessarily um, stop what I'm doing. I keep my hand motion going, I keep the airbrush moving, and I just kind of give the trigger a little bit of a wiggle, and that usually gets the paint flowing again. Uh, this paint flows really well when it's thinned with alcohol. Uh, 
and uh, it's really nice to work with. And so I just I just build this up all over the model and do it slowly and in quite a few passes until I get everything looking like uh, like I think it should and giving it some age and some depth in that. All right, you can see how that looks with the post shading on there. Um, it's definitely a stylistic approach. Uh, if you know if that's something you you say, well, I, I, I appreciate the method, but I just don't want to use that. Well, don't use it. I don't use it on all models. Um, uh, there's sometimes I just want the effect uh, on a model, and there may not be any particular special reason why I want it. I just think eh, I think I want to do that. So um, it has its place both post shading and post fading. Sometimes I use one, not the other. Sometimes I use them both. Uh, so uh, there's, there's very practical uses for them. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it, as with anything in this hobby. Um, the more experience you have. Uh, I, would, I would recommend that as you work with these techniques, um, that you experiment with uh, the effect that the, the different thinning will have on the application of the paint, the distance away from the model that you do this. I have to do it uh, with the camera between uh, my, you know, me and the model, which which necessitates a certain distance uh, from it. But in actuality, when I'm doing this off camera, um, sometimes I get the the airbrush just right in at it, uh, and other times I pull away because if you pull away, you'll get a lighter, more blurred line. If you get in tighter, you'll get a darker line um, that's much tighter. You can combine the two. So there's there's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, and if you've not done it before, expect you may be a little frustrated the first time you do it. Uh, most people report to me that you know the first time they try it, they get frustrated with it. But the more they do it across a model, uh, the quicker they they uh, get comfortable with the application, and and uh, after that they enjoy it. So. It's a great tool to have in your toolkit of things that you can apply to your models. The key to, to any post shading and post fading is low air pressure and thinning your paints with something that's going to allow you to really reduce the opacity and then just work slowly and carefully and you'll get the result that you want. Well, thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you're still watching at this point. I'm grateful. If you've not already done so, click the little subscribe link down over here in the lower right corner. And there's a little bell icon if you'll click that. And uh, uh, that, will let, uh, that will let you know when I have new videos out. I'd also be grateful if you would drop a comment down below and give this video a like. Um, that lets me know what you think and helps me of the video and helps me grow the channel, which I'm trying to do. Uh, there's also links down below to my website, and social media, and things like that. And there's a link to Patreon if you would like to support the work that I do uh, on this channel. If you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for supporting the work that I do. It's a blessing to me. It's a blessing to my family. Um, like, I've, like I always say, and it's, and it's the absolute truth, I could not do this uh, in the manner that I do it with the equipment and uh, the models and the materials and at the pace that I do it if it weren't for you. So thank you very much for supporting the work that I do to bring this to everybody. Um, we're so very grateful for it. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.